Avengers, assemble. In the wake of Endgame, some were lost, others regained. They're good. What happens next? Stay tuned, true believers, as we try to find out. Peter Melnick. Graphic designer, comic book enthusiast, and podcast pontificator, and I'm Eddie Wilson. Upstate New York radio announcer in the Sullivan Catskills, with an inordinate amount of catching up in his own comic book universe. Ready? It's time for a new episode of The Marvelists. Hello, people of Earth. This is Paul Shear. You might know me from Black Monday, The League, or my podcast, How Did This Get Made? And you are listening to The Marvelous with Pete Melnick and Eddie Wilson. Welcome, everyone, to The Marvelists, the Marvel Universe podcast. I'm Peter Melnick. And I'm Eddie Wilson. And before we get into the usual rigmarole of today's episode and introducing our very special guest, we want to tell you all at home how you can get a hold of us on them, thar social medias. We do, so... First off, go on Facebook at facebook.com slash The Marvelists. Give us a follow on there or whatever it is on Facebook nowadays. I don't care. Go on Twitter and Instagram at I care. The Marvelists. Oh, you're like Faith No More. You care a lot Mm. about disasters, fires, floods, and killer bees. But you can find us on those. You can also find us individually on social media. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Melnick. I'm on TikTok for God knows why at Peter Melnick, but better because the other Peter Melnick was taken. You can also find Eddie on only one social media platform. He wants to keep it simple, and that's Instagram, and it's at? I am simple. Eddie, 9193. You can also find us on a wide variety of streaming platforms, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher Radio, Podbean, SoundCloud, Spotify, etc., etc. And remember, go on iTunes, rate, review, subscribe, and share five-star ice cream machines, because we're pressed for time for that. I want to, you know, get through that. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Also, you can find us... On Patreon, support the show, patreon.com slash the marvelists or at, or sorry, slash the marvelous. There we go. I just wanted to give you the Holy. cue. And when you go for as little as $3 a month, you get a newsletter, which I admit I've been slacking on, but you also get early access to episodes of the show 24 hours before they go live on the main RSS feed. For $5 a month, you end up getting our show, The Fantastic Voyage, where myself, Eddie, and our audio engineer, John Sherburn, joins us as we cover all of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four. 102 issues plus annuals and whatever is going on. But mm. this month's episode, we're going to be joined with an honorable mentions, Shane Hagedorn. And next month, we're going to be joined with Tom Brevoort of Marvel Comics. The return. The return, yes. The return in ending. And also, for $8 a month... You can pick an episode topic of your choosing for this show. And if we think you don't suck, you can be a special guest co-host. Just ask Jeremy Bagley because we don't think he sucks and we think he's a delight. Multiple guest. Exa- well, yeah, because we don't think he sucks. Yeah, that many times. <laughs> <laughs> so now, Eddie, on the mm. other end of the tin cannon string, we are joined with Paul Shear of oh so many different shows such as The League, Big Mouth, which I'm a fan of and I'm... I'm well versed in being myself. He's also the co-host of the wildly popular podcast, How Did This Get Made? And he writes funny books for Marvel Comics. And speaking of Marvel Comics, we do a Marvel podcast. Oh, wait, that's not the thing I'm talking about. He directed and starred in a documentary on Disney+, Plus, available streaming now, a part of the Marvel 616, the episode Lost and Found. This is a long meandering intro. Paul, how are you? I'm great, guys. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. What an expansive show you do. I, I feel uh, daunted just to be in your presence. And winded. <laughs> I mean, just, I'm still recovering for, from the stairs. Glad we didn't have a hang up there. Jeez. And I meant the phone, not the uh, problem. <laughs> so now, Paul, you're a writer for Marvel. You're a writer in comedic elements and oh, so many other things. With Marvel, how did you get the Marvel bug growing up? You know, it's interesting. I grew up as an only child and I grew up in a town or a school where comics were just not the thing. Um, So I kind of read them on the side and I got into X-Men around Chris Claremont time. And I think my my real entry point, though, to comics um, and just like loving to have them were, were the movie adaptation books that Marvel did. Like I had an Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom comic book. I had the Star Wars comic books because you know, back then they weren't just coming out on, you know, video on demand. You'd have to wait or you have to tape them. So I got to like live in these worlds through the comic books. And so I kind of was a movie fan first and got into the, the, you know, kind of the 
off-brand Marvel books. And then when I was in high school, or a little bit before high school, got into uh, real comic books. And again, though, I didn't really have someone to guide me, someone to say, oh, you should read this or that. I didn't have a place to go. So I kind of do it a little bit at a time and amass a bunch and then get away, get to a comic book store later and get a few more. Um, it wasn't until I was in college where I was in uh, NYU in New York that I was walking around after school one day and I wandered into a comic book shop and I found Astro City. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then Astro City was my gateway back in to the world of Marvel and all these characters because I think what I realized at that point was I was really into the writers and I started to follow the writers and that kind of goes till today. Uh, you know, for example, I've never really been interested in Thor, but when Jason Aaron, who uh, who I loved after he did a Star Wars run, was writing uh, Thor, I was like, oh, I got to read that, and I just absolutely just devoured it and. You know, and I started to realize like, oh, people like Ed Brubaker and, uh, and, you know, uh, Jerry Duggan, you know, I just was, I was going to follow the people I loved wherever they went. And it's kind of the same way you treat movies or anything like that. You know, it's less about the character and sometimes the people behind the characters uh, that make them come to life in a special, unique way. And in recent memory, one of the titles that you worked on involved Donny Cates's Cosmic Ghost Rider and... There haven't yeah. really been a lot of people that have worked on the character yet. You know, it's technically Frank Castle slash Ghost Rider, but it's its own unique individual character. And like I said, you're one of the first people to really work on him. Now, how much are you borrowing from the Donnie run and then in- incorporating your own element? Well, you know, for me, uh, that was tricky. I was actually, me and my partner, Nick Giovanetti, we were the first people to write uh, cosmic ghostwriter after Donnie had introduced him. So we had that the burden of taking a character that was incredibly popular, um, that kind of, you know, every now and then that that happens. It kind of takes everybody by storm. And we had to kind of continue that story. And that was a really tricky thing because I had written for Marvel before that, but I had written in characters that I knew the voices of a little bit better. And we had a little, you know, we didn't have that much to go off of. So you know, Donnie was out here in LA and I got to sit and talk with him a bunch and we're still buddies. And, um, I kind of asked how he wrote, uh, Cosmic Ghost Rider, like what he thought, like what was the voice cadence in his head? Because I felt like it was too close to put our own spin on this character at this point. You know, this is a moment where in my mind, we had to kind of continue what he started. And, you know, we also knew going into that, it was going to, upset fans only because it wasn't Donnie. Even if Donnie was like, yes, I agree to this. I think this is great. You know, and Donnie was incredibly supportive of what we did, but we were kind of bracing for, oh God, what is going to happen? And, you know, I think Marvel at that point as well, they were very much concerned about, well, you know, this is a big franchise character and we want to make sure this is going to be handled the right way. And we had a bunch of fun ideas and we, we found a voice. We found everything for this character in a way that I think really, I think really reads together great in the trade. And I think by the second or third, probably by the third episode, the fans really jumped in and, and got on board. And that was, I think, when we started to have a little bit more fun too. You know, the I always say like when you're writing TV, the pilot is the hardest thing to do because you have to introduce so much. You have to show that you you have a vision. And for Nick and I, we really were trying to do a lot in the pilot or the first book of our series. And then by the third we really got loose and uh, yeah, I'm super proud of it, but it was more daunting than anything I'd ever done before. And in regards to a lot of different characters that you've been involved with, the big one lately is brute force. And one of the Mm. things I like about the documentary was I'm a big Deadpool fan. I've, you know, been a fan of the character for like almost 10 years now. And when there was a Deadpool by annual, there was a story involving brute force And I laughed during the documentary because there was a moment where you had acted like you never heard of Brute Force before. And I loved it because I'm like, wait a minute, he wrote that story I like. Yeah, you know, look, when you're making a documentary, you have to kind of create a little bit of a, uh, you're telling a story, right? And the way you get the information out, you know, for me, what we do in the the book uh, or the doc is we talk to different people about what they remember, you know. The, the least interesting documentary would be me just reading books and talking about 
characters. I really wanted to make it, you know, visual and interesting and, and make it like a movie. So the way that we approached it when we first came into the documentary was in truth, we were like, here's a bunch of characters that I think might be interesting for this documentary. If we find more, great. But um, we know that this is uh, like basically the the back of the batting cage or whatever. You know, it's like it's our stopgap. Like we got we have these. And Brute Force was a character that I or characters that I really were interested in because they're so bizarre and people really love them. And so they were kind of put on a shelf like we'll definitely talk about Brute Force. Um, we'll definitely talk about like Billy Ray Cyrus, um, as a time traveling knight. Um, and then when I reach out to Donnie, Donnie's like, I really want to talk about us one. And, you know, and so I was like, great. And I brought in Jerry because Jerry was the person who actually introduced brute force to me. So there's a sort of, um, while it's a little bit of a bending of fiction. The reason why we wrote that Deadpool was because Jerry brought us into Marvel and Jerry said, Hey, we want to do something with brute force. We think that you guys could do something with brute force. And that was, you know, so that was a true, you know, it was a kind of a reenactment of an actual scene. There's just, again, one of the things about that documentary that I really loved too, was the exploration of what is in the Marvel universe. And, you know, one a quick, a little aside, have you seen the prices of how much brute force numbers one through four are going for on eBay right now? Yes, I saw that after the documentary, they definitely went up in price, uh, which is hilarious to me. Uh, you know, they are collected in a the trade. They are, there's ways to get them. Um, you know, it, it was interesting because I love brute force and I love the story behind them. There's a great article written in like CBR uh, dot com about it at one point. And I just kind of was, I, I just, you know, people would send me stuff because we had written that episode that or that issue. And, you know, I kind of keep track of them. And when we were kind of figuring out what story we wanted to tell, it quickly became apparent that that was the most interesting story because unlike most books, like we didn't want to, we didn't want to be poking fun at, you know, characters that failed. We wanted to kind of explore these really kind of wild ideas. And a lot of the times a wild idea is just a really creative writer uh, who try something and it doesn't work. And for everyone that doesn't work, there's like 12 that do. Um, but what was interesting about Brute Force was it was created by a toy designer. And that toy designer came into Marvel and was like, I have an idea for a line of toys that could become huge if we support them with a comic book. The way that they had been going in the past was, you know, G.I. Joe is huge as a toy. They make a comic book to help push it forward. This went the other way. Like, let's make a toy and then do a comic book to sell the toy. Um, and that to me was a more interesting story. So that's why we really jumped on them. And, and I think, you know, I, I never know what people know about the Marvel universe. And I still think as much as they are big for Marvel heads, brute force was kind of a little bit under the radar for a lot of people. So to see the prices jump because people are like, Oh my God, what is this? And will they also become the next big thing? There's only four issues, you know, it's Marvel, it's on Disney plus, it's not some like Yahoo doing it. So I think uh, people are making a, a smart investment. I don't know if it will pay off, but uh, you know, maybe I should put my money in the comic books instead of the stock market. I think it's a, it's a better investment. And it's just, it's really funny because like, you know, I'm, I'm a part of the uh, cartoonist kayfabe Facebook group uh, ringside seats. And, you know, we're talking about this and there's the term, the kayfabe effect where when Ed Pisker and Jim Rugg mention a book on the show, it ends up going up in price. And, you know, they jokingly said, Wow, even on Disney Plus, they have the kayfabe effect. And, <laughs> you know, they were also mentioning about one book that you guys mentioned in the documentary, and that was Street Poet Ray. And yes. What other kind of books like that are there that, you know, that didn't make it onto the final product that, you know, you guys were fascinated with? You mentioned the Billy Ray Cyrus one, especially, the Marvel music. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the one that I, re I mean, I'll get to Billy Ray in a second, too. But the one that we really wanted to talk about, the one that I thought was so interesting was uh, NFL Super Pro, which I think a lot of people remember. It was a collaboration with the NFL. And um, it's such an interesting, you know, it's a quarterback who becomes a superhero. His sidekick is his cameraman. The cameraman throws pennies. Um, you know, they're taking down uh, corruption in, in the, in, you know, in the world of sports. Um, and that was something that I really wanted to talk about. But there are rights issues. And that's kind of the tricky thing. You know, it is NFL using the NFL logo. I was on the league for seven years. And you'll, if you ever watch the league, you'll never have seen a, an NFL logo. We did very good jobs of trying to create as close to the colors and logos as we could, but there was never actually a, 
a logo used. Even when uh, we went and visited Jerry Jones, uh, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, uh, we, that was the closest that we got, but we had to be very careful there because the NFL is very protective of their brand. Uh, and you know, so the same thing happened with uh, Billy Ray Cyrus, which is Billy Ray Cyrus is a human being. He's a person. His image is, is used here. So it was like, okay, what are the rights issues to talk about these things? So we overshot with everybody. And, and um, you know, there was asbestos lady, uh, you know, who was like the human torches uh, nemesis. You know, she had a suit made of asbestos. We had Hell Cow, who has come back recently, um, I think in West Coast Avengers. Um, we had uh, Hell Cow is a part cow, part vampire. There's a lot of weird, uh, you know, we talked about it very briefly and I'm so happy that Disney Plus let me get it in, but like Leather Boy, you know, we were able to kind of, hit these things. And I think the funniest part to me, and I would love to do another documentary about it, is all the quote unquote cool characters that Marvel created. Like, you know, it feel it felt very much to me like here's a bunch of middle-aged men sitting around going, what are the kids like? Uh, yeah, spiky hair and big glasses. And they all like came across, um, as bizarre when you look at them now they're they are not they do not age well at all it is a, a real mess and you all you, real quick going back over to uh, nfl super pro friend of the show fabian Nicieza, the co-creator of the character he had mentioned like one of the perks of writing that was he got free season pass tickets for the nfl that year so he got to go wow. to as many games as humanly possible oh see now that's amazing <laughs> Uh, going back, a couple of things you touched on, Paul, that I need to probably catch up with, but I, that resonated a little bit with me. You mentioned US-1. I said, wait a second, Peter pointed at me because he knows that I have that, I don't know, 11-issue series from when that was. But One of the things about this show is Eddie's known for his inordinate amount of catching up to do in his comic book reading life. And there was one episode where I go, Eddie, have you read Infinity Gauntlet? And he goes, no, I have not, but I did read US-1 recently. So recently, uh, <laughs> that was when it came out in my heyday of collecting 24 titles a month. I was on them on top of them all. I'm pretty sure you read it recently, though. <laughs> no, no. I may have refound it where they were. But I was saying if US-1 was mentioned, can like Team America be far behind? God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I mean, you know, th- those seem to be around the same time period. So uh, but the first thing that struck me, what you said, Paul, was getting into the comic books via the movie adaptations. And that's the first time I've heard anybody get into comic books that way. So good going on that. Very cool. And it made me also wonder if um, you, you had collected the, I guess, eventually they maybe put them all together in a square bound volume of whatever movie it was, if it was a two issue shot or or you got the actual individual issues and whether since they were movie adaptations, you wound up finding them in other places besides a comic book store that could they could have been in regular bookstores since they were movie adaptations, like among the magazine racks or something. Yeah, you know, I think I remember getting books at like the grocery store. Like I think my first Spider-Man book was something that was like next to like TV Guide, you know, or like next to like the card section at a grocery store. Like, you know, it wasn't like I was in a comic book shop getting a Spider-Man book. There was a lot of these reprints. And, you know, as a kid, you never even rem- remember where you even get these things. It's sort of like your parents throw it down in front of you and you're like, OK, cool, Spider-Man, let- let's do it. Yeah, for me, it was a barber shop with no cover and... I think it was a Marvel team up issue with Spidey and Cap or something like that. Uh, or it was a store that had a spinner rack, among other things. Like you said, the cards yes. and the confectionaries and whatever else was going on there. Yeah. Did you say confectionaries? I did. It's 2020, Eddie. <laughs> well, that was a con- it, there was such thing as a confectionery store. So, yeah. At least my brain is telling me that. So, the, the, the uh, you know, pre teenage Eddie is saying that. Now, in addition to all of that, you know, Eddie, you, you mentioning the uh, the movie adaptation stories, and Paul, you as well. What was what were some of your favorite ones? Like that, you know, were the most accurate, especially to the movie going experience. You know, for me, I I don't even know if I was that judgmental about it. Like, you know, like I just wanted to continue the story. You know, I was a big reader. The way I got into reading as a kid was just reading like novelizations of films. I just felt like it connected me. It was like what I was interested in and I wanted to live in those worlds. So I wasn't looking at anything with a critical eye. Um, I think Star Wars was really fun. And in a way it was like having a VCR. You could just play what you wanted when you wanted, you know, by opening the book and looking at the pictures and, and seeing it all, you know, so I have those books that meant a lot to me. I, you know, subscribed to Bantha tracks and, you know, the Star Trek magazines, like all these things would come to your house. And, you know, before the internet, it was the only way you're getting inside scoop on things or seeing things. So it was really, you know, it was kind of fun for me to kind of, um, 
I, I don't know, just return to those characters. I, yeah, so I, I don't know if I could say like, oh, well, you know, this writer really captured Indiana Jones the best way. It was just basically a retelling of Temple of Doom, but just as a comic book. Did you ever read the uh, Dune one? No, I've actually never seen Dune. Really? Mm. Yeah. I'm going to wait. I'm, I'm excited for uh, the upcoming one, the uh, one that's going to be available in theaters. Yeah, the Dallas Villeneuve. Yeah, uh, HBO Max. It's such a weird time for stuff like that, especially now, you know, Wonder Woman is going to be getting that experience and we don't know what's going to happen next. But, you know, we know you as well as a hardcore movie fan to the point where you have your own show. How did this get made? And how does how does it feel, you know, with this past year of all of how amazing 2020 is that you have not been able to go to a movie theater? You know, it's interesting. I have two kids uh, that are four and six and they've been keeping me very busy Um, and you know, so a lot of the things that people have been lamenting, I am just sort of like, I'm just trying to keep my head above water at this point, like whatever, whatever. And, um, and then the other day I was driving, uh, and I passed by a movie theater and I felt a pang. I was like, oh my gosh, that's something I have not done. Right. I've just not, I've not gone. And that's such a big part of my life. And, you know, it reminded me of last year when it was Christmas time, I went with my son to go see like the special elf uh, act along at the Alamo Draft House and how fun that was. And I love that collective communal experience, and especially as like a parent uh, of newer kids or younger kids. Uh, it's a great way to get out of the house, you know? So I, I, I miss that too. I miss, I miss like having that little alone time and, and just being able to focus and not, you know, have somebody texting you or folding laundry at the same time, all that sort of stuff. And now, you know, on the topic of, movies and your show how did this get made uh justin kaplowitz asks is there any movie on how did this get made that either you june diane jason manzoukas or all three of you refuse to cover for any reason oh yeah absolutely i mean we make no bones about what we don't cover i mean uh we're not going to cover a movie that we have close relationships in you know we're we are not journalists we are here to have fun and you know like we don't need to uh to bring our friends into that you know if we if we have a connection to it uh we we basically uh we avoid it uh i think we also avoid a lot of comedies for the most part uh just because that's the world that we're into and we get what's hard about that uh, and also comedies there's not much to say about comedies, right? Comedies don't work. It's like, ah, it wasn't funny. You know, but action movies and dramas, there's so much more there uh, to kind of talk about. And then obviously the the most obvious one is we don't cover any movies that we've been in. And that's just because it's like, it's, uh, it's not, it's just not fun. I think the fun of it is this show has always been all of us sitting around after we've seen a movie and talking like, oh my God, do you believe that or this or this or that? And once you're in the movie, you know how it was made. You know what the decisions, you know all that sort of stuff. There's no, um, you know, we like to be the audience. So those are the three kind of tenets of, of films that we pick. And and obviously movies that are not just bad, but they're fun to watch. Uh, you know, I think in the beginning part of the podcast, we did a lot of movies that were just bad. And we realized like our audience wants us to see movies that are, they want to enjoy the process, too. We shouldn't be putting them through torture. I mean, obviously, some of it is torture, but uh, we want to at least be smart about what kind of torture we're giving them. Did you guys ever do anything involving Mystery Science Theater when the uh, show was brought back on Netflix? No, we don't really cross uh, paths with them. I mean, I'm, you know, obviously friends with all those people uh, from, you know, Baron is on Grace and Frankie. I'm friends with Felicia Day. Uh, I know Joel. Uh, Pat and Oswald, obviously, we are buddies as well. So, um no, you know, we, they do their thing. Rift Tracks does their thing. Flophouse does their thing. We all do our own thing. I, you know, people are always asking us to do crossovers and stuff. Um, I, I never truly interested in that because, you know, it's not, what I think is interesting is at the end of the day, our show is about bad movies, but really I think what people are tuning in for, and I think this is across the board with all podcasts, is the relationship and the people that are there, right? You're tuning in to hear the voices on the mic. And um, and we just happen to be talking about bad movies. Um, and I think that's a big part of why our show is successful. And I think it's a big part of why every show is successful. You you get you whatever they whatever the people you're listening to are talking about, that's why you're there. And um and so, yeah, so I often kind of stay away from like doing that because I think what we've found, especially in the last two years, the show is at its strongest and best when it's the three of us with somebody that we know or no one at all. And so that's what we've really been doing. We don't do guests anymore because 
it is, um, we just find it to be a little bit distracting, honestly. Like we, we, we have such a better rapport and the shows are so much more fun when we don't have to worry about making room for anybody else. You know, it's, it's very interesting though, that you had mentioned earlier about, you know, you don't want to, you know, attack the character. Like this is a bad idea or something to that effect. And it, it is a very admirable thing, you know, in terms of like, it, it is a creation of these people. It's a, it was misunderstood at the time. And, you know, like, again, with brute force, brute force could have worked at a different time, probably, especially, you know, when you hear the elements of, oh, this was written, it was supposed to be written for this kind of person, but the comics at the time were written for these kind of people, and it didn't really pan out. And the long and rambling part of the story, I'm guessing, get trying to get at is... uh in regards to like a movie like The Room. The Room is a completely misunderstood movie. You know, Tommy Wiseau has gone on saying, oh, it's supposed to be a black comedy. I don't know about that. But, you know, there's just oh so many different things. And how do you feel about seeing like a quote unquote misunderstood creation like that? Well, look, you know, I am a creator, right? I am a person who is a writer and a producer and a director and actor and all these things. And I've made things and I understand the idea and and the effort and energy it takes to make something. Now, would I be bummed if something I did appeared on one of my shows? Absolutely. But also I'd be looking at it in a way where if I have to be real with myself, okay, there would be an issue with it. Like something didn't work. And I've talked to some directors who've been on, uh, our show and they have a good sense of humor about it. And there's a month, there's a bunch of reasons why something doesn't work. And, you know, and we try never to go at it from a mean point of view because we are essentially kindred spirits. Um, you know, and, uh, Reggie Hudlin said something really interesting. It's like, the idea is something, but you have to ask yourself, like, did I do it, uh, as did I do it the best way I could? Right. And, and that is a big question. You may have a great idea. Like I, th- I think people spend so much time remaking great things remake some bad stuff. Like go back and look at some things that failed. Remake that because the core of the idea, the kernel of the idea is good. It wasn't executed as well as it could be. And that's, and I I feel like it's such a weird idea to remake what already worked, you know, like go pine great ideas that were executed badly. And, you know, and, and, uh, you know, so for, for me, I don't know if the room is misunderstood. I think the room is actually understood perfectly. It's, it is a pure version of what Tommy Wiseau thought Rebel Without a Cause and Streetcar Named Desire is. You know, he's a big Brando and especially James Dean fan. And if you watch Rebel Without a Cause and you watch The Room back to back, you're like, this is the same movie. It truly is. I, I remember watching it and I was texting uh, the Francos and uh, Rogan. I was like, this is the same movie. And they're like, I know. It clearly is his homage to that. And you get to understand like a little bit more about where he is. And, and the room is such a special movie. It's such a uniquely interesting. Uh, I, I always say that the room should be on the list of the hundred greatest movies of all time, because very rarely are you able to create a, a movie that is so enjoyable and also not very good. It's almost like, uh, you know, reverse Kubrick in a way, like there is something so watchable, but something so bad about that film. I, I don't know what it is. And I, I hate when films try to aspire to that, whether that is like, you know, uh, Sharknado or, you know, Velocipaster, you know, like, let's just make, make it and be it or, but like trying to like find this like middle ground. Uh, that's, it's something that actually like irritates me. I'm like, I don't need the Gary Busey as a chin- gingerbread man movie. It's like, I want to see somebody who's actually trying to make something really interesting and, and, and how they articulate themselves may not be exactly right. That's, that's more interesting to me than just kind of copying or aping uh, what you think might be funny bad. And, you know, on our show, we had done a three-week uh, episode list of The Punisher. And on our show, we covered Punisher by Lexi Alexander, Punisher Warzone. And you guys had Lexi on the show and you talked to her about her involvement with it and how everything came to be with it. And it's funny because that movie and the Dolph Lundgren movie are some of my favorite portrayals of the character of Frank Castle. It's just there's something about it. And yes, they're completely maligned in how they were executed. 
and I realize that pun if with the Punisher, Ooh. but uh, mm-hmm. there's just something about those movies. And again, on your show, being able to have Lexi on the show, talk with her about that and how she had this vision and part of it couldn't come to fruition because of that. But there's just something about movies like that where that movie holds a very special place in my heart as a comic book fan. Yeah, I mean, look, that was a time when comic book movies were not in vogue. And uh, and I think what you have seen is, uh, you know, Iron Man set the tone for what the new comic book movie is. And everything kind of falls in that category. And every now and then we break it open. You know, it's like something like The Joker. I'm in this movie uh, called Arch Enemy, which kind of plays in a world of kind of breaking down superhero tropes. Um, but you're right. Like, that was at a time when people didn't know what they wanted and and it kind of walked this weird line. And I think what Lexi talks about and something that I think we can all, you know, everybody who has made something for TV or film or uh, knows this idea, which is like a death by a, a thousand cuts, you know, uh, okay, this is not a big note. I can deal with that. And then you keep on taking a bunch of small notes. And by the time you're done, what you've made is not, reflexive of what you were trying to do uh, or it's a bastardized version of what you were trying to do and I think a lot of the times most of these movies that we focus on on the show have an element of that oh well we wanted to do that but we didn't have the budget oh we wanted to explain that but we didn't have the scene we wanted to do that and it's it's a miracle that good movies get made because when you read about like something like Apocalypse Now it barely got made you know when you read about you know Instincts and The Godfather Thank God Francis Ford Coppola didn't do that. And not just to reference Francis Ford Coppola films, but the idea that like every great movie has stories of we almost didn't get this thing that makes you believe this movie. You know, this actor almost didn't do this part. This person, you know, improvised that one moment that is the iconic moment. You know, so movies are uh, a fleeting, weird thing and a TV too. So it's, you know, sometimes you get like, Three fourths of the pieces, but you don't have uh, they don't have the full thing. Now, our next question comes from Brian Apodaca of the Cartoonist Kayfabe Ringside Seats message board, and I really hope I didn't butcher his name. But he asks, who would Paul Sherp like to play in either a Image Comics founder biopic or a Mad Men style series of the early Marvel bullpen? He suggests Steve Ditko. Ooh, look, I mean, I'll take it. Uh, I love that idea of a Steve Ditko, like a Mad Men. Uh, you know, Marvel. I mean, that that's really, uh, that would be really great. I mean, in, I'm in. Let's do it. Imagine Jim Steranko just en- involved in there too because he, he still lives like it's Mad Men every day of his life. It's yeah. Insane. Well, it's such a great, it's such a great world. You know, it's such a, uh, there's so much going on there. And I, I think, you know, in this documentary series that I did, um, everyone is a little bit different. And they did a great one about the women of Marvel too. You know, um, you get to kind of see, uh you know, all these, you know, I think Stan takes a lot of light and he should, but there's so much out there. There's so many people out there that did so many cool things. Now, this question also comes from Noah Apodaca. I'm guessing they're brothers. Uh, if Paul could rip one character from an indie verse and bring them into a Marvel team up for a four to five issue special series penciled by Todd Nock, naturally, which mm, character him, would it yeah. be? <laughs> Wait, so he wants me to take... An, an indie, indie movie? No, an indie character. Star? An, oh, okay, an indie comic book character. Huh. Okay, that would be an interesting... All right. Um, hmm, this is going to be... Hmm, I'm like I'm thinking about like a couple of different things. Like, uh, obviously, you know, I... Boy, oh boy. Because it's also like there's so many... Like, you know, I'm thinking like, oh, should I go like Saga? Should I go, you know, East... Of, like, there's, you know, East of West... Um, Lumberjanes, I don't know. Like, uh, I mean, Preacher, I mean, Preacher's already been done. I mean, I love Why the Last Man, but that doesn't really work outside. You don't, he doesn't need anybody. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. By the way, no all saga right. at all this year. And this year has been an absolute dumpster fire. Coincidence? I think so. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Um, man, you know, I really like the saga characters a lot. And I think. Maybe like bringing the saga world into the Guardians world. That would be a fun kind of crossover. Uh, you know, kind of like having them be another yeah, another part of it. You know, I, I, it's it's tricky because it's sort of like, oh, who would make a good team up? Um, maybe, you know, I would also I would also talk about like that that idea of I mean, I love this um, 
gosh, what is the name of it? It's like this buddy cop uh, book that was written by, um, oh my gosh, now I'm going to totally forget. Uh, this is my this is my bad brain of just remember going, oh, what was that? Uh, but there's a great like buddy cop, like it's a, it's kind of like a point break style, like these cops on the con um, that I love so much. But it's interesting because it, once you involve anybody in the Marvel world, like they have to have crazy superpowers. So it's like, what, do I put Invincible in there? You know, like that kind of a, you know, do I do that? Or, um, yeah, I don't know. I know that's, a, that's a tricky one. Do I, do I just bring in like, do I bring in like, uh, what's his face? Um, uh, why am I forgetting his name now? Uh, Judge Dredd? I mean, is like, you know, do you bring him him? I, yeah, I guess, you know, you need somebody who has a lot of powers. <laughs> the uh, Judge Dredd meets the Nova Corps. I would love. Hey, look, that would be great. I'm in. Just battle of the helmets, and you know, you huh. also mentioned Invincible. By the way, Invincible did team up with Spider Man during uh, Robert Kirkman's run on Marvel Team Up in the uh, mid aughts. And ooh, I've, I have to catch that. I got to check that. It's it's a very random issue. Like I always forget that that issue happened. Uh, Tom Fraser asks, "Were you into fantasy football before the league? And does do you still play after the show finished?" Uh, no. And yes. Um, you know, when I first uh, auditioned for the league, I didn't know anything about fantasy football. As a matter of fact, I didn't even want to audition for it. I, I, I said no. Um, and it was because I just felt like I couldn't feel, I couldn't feel confident in the way that I was improvising about something I didn't really know about. And they said, don't worry about it. Fantasy football is the backdrop, but you don't need to know about that. Just come in and play this character. And I did. And I'm so thankful that I did because I love doing that show. And it got me indoctrinated into a bigger world of football. Like I was always like, a football fan, like a a team fan, right? But I wasn't like a league fan, if that makes sense. I'm basketball is a lot more my my thing. Um uh the league of it all and knowing all the you know players. So um so for me it was a great indoctrination to kind of understand fantasy. Uh, and now I still play. I'm in I think three leagues right now. Yeah. And I'm doing terrible this season. This season, I didn't even really, I, I kind of didn't even want to play this season because of the COVID of it all. And it just makes it impossible. So I'm just like, I'm just eating, I'm just eating it. And uh, I'm just hoping I don't come in last, which I'm not. So as long as I didn't do that, I'm, I'm fine. So when you got into the, the league, like you said, the audition, you weren't really looking towards doing that. Um, I was going to ask though, how that even came about that you're being your first, I think, TV thing. Oh, no, it was not. Uh, my first TV thing, I guess, that people most know me for is Best Week Ever. And then uh, after Best Week Ever, which is like a VH1 kind of uh, talking head show, I created my own television show called Human Giant with uh, Rob Hubel and Aziz Ansari, directed by Jason Wolner. And Jason Wolner just directed uh, Borat 2, as a matter of fact. Um, so we did that for a little bit. And then after that was over, uh, I went to... Yeah, I mean... Uh, I did 30 Rock in there and, and yeah, and I think NTSF, we had shot the pilot. So yeah, we had, you know, so by the time I got to the league, I'd, I'd done a few things and kind of created my own things a couple of times. So yeah, that was, you know, so that was just gotten to me because Jeff and Jackie were looking for uh, comedy talent that they knew and people were recommending and who could improvise. Now, this question comes from Horror Movie Barbecue and he asks, what would your dream Marvel project be? And if given the option, what role would you play? Okay, this is a good question, uh, and I think I have a, a good answer for it. I, I'm not, I'm not positive, right? Uh, but there's so many great uh, Marvel characters out there, right? And I think that I have to be realistic about it. Like, I would love to do the Marvel method. Uh, you know, on Black Monday this season, I, you know, I, I slimmed down and I put on some weight. I didn't have anybody helping me do it. I did the whole thing. So that was really, you know, I, I can prove I can do it. Um, you know, I think but there's not many bald men in the Marvel world, you know? So I have to like also be like, all right, well, where are my bald men? And, you know, I may have to like wear a wig and I think I'm fine with that. I'll, you know, I'll definitely, uh, I'll definitely wear a wig. I, uh, I, you know, look at, if I'm going to go bald, maybe I can bring in Silver Surfer. I know it's been brought in before, but maybe this is my time to, you know, step it up. Shave, shave the goatee and all that. Yeah. Be- shave, shave the goatee. I get that goatee. Like I didn't have that for a long time, so I can get back to that. That'd be really good. And uh, I'm forgetting the name now. Um, oh my gosh, you guys might be able to help me. There is a guy who pushed Bruce Banner out of the way of the gamma rays. Um, and Rick Jones? And then, no. was it? No. no, that's just the opposite. What are you talking about? Oh. <laughs> From the comic book or a different version or... Uh, from the comic books. So yeah, so he like he pushed Bruce Banner out of the way 
Uh, and he then became like a sidekick to the Avengers. Uh, and, uh, and that, I, remember, I feel like his name is Jim and I'm just forgetting, uh, what, you know, hold on, give me a second. Cause I want to, I want to Google it to make sure I give you the right name. What do you think? Name? I think um, it is Rick Jones, which I really enjoy Eddie now. Rick for- Jones. Yes. That's it. That's it. Yeah. No, I just can't figure. Rick Jones. <laughs> no. no, that's just the opposite. What are you talking about? is the level of program where we can scoff at each other oh you didn't know the name of that comic book character uh yes rick jones rick jones is the character that i feel like i would love to play because i could cross over like doesn't rick jones like go up with like captain marvel at a certain point like he's with the avengers like to me that i need a favreau-esque character that can exist in the mcu for a long time i don't need to have big superpowers i just want to hang out uh you know kind of like what don Cheadle gets to do you know gets to be around and uh you know I'll take it. I, I guess I'm making a big push for uh, Rick Jones. I love Rick Jones because as he's been referred to multiple times, he is the Forrest Gump of the Marvel Universe because he's been a rock star. He's been an author. He's been Bucky. He's been a sidekick of the Avengers, a sidekick of the Hulk. He's been involved with Captain Marvel. Yeah, just oh so much about that character. It's such, so much cool stuff he's been able to do. And he's just like, yep. Yep, I'm in there. Did it. Did it, probably, yeah, <laughs> relax. Nobody's gonna get. Yeah, so that's right. He's been around since what, 1962, I guess. Yeah, for a while. I kind of love that you knew that so well offhand. Well, come on, Incredible Hulk number one. Now, this question also comes from Michael Condro. Will, how did this get made? Do the 1994 Roger Corman Fantastic Four? Yeah, Michael. You know, a great question. Uh, we have definitely thought about it. I think all always the question with our show is, is it readily available? Can we get our audience to get it? And that is the, um, you know, that is the the big thing. When we're doing a show like this, you know, we always want to make sure that people can can see it uh, and see it legally. And we have to get into all those d- different ideas. But that that is, uh, I think, the real holdup with that one. And like, it's a shame, too. You know, we've done an interview with Roger Corman talking to him about it. And it's one of those movies where no one knows who has the rights to it no one knows where the original is supposedly avi arad destroyed the original print so who knows yeah i mean i remember that i would get it at comic book conventions um you know and uh you know it's interesting there are these weird little zones like a uh, human giant is a show that uh is very hard to find and we've been trying to get it released on streaming but it's been the same issue. Like, well, who has the rights to it? Who owns it? We, you know, we luckily have all the the drives, the hard drives. Uh, but uh, but we can't uh, we can't find it always. You know, we can't know who who can uh, release it. And it's interesting too because you know with uh, the Fantastic Four, I own it on Blu-ray. I bought a bootleg copy of it off of eBay. And amazing. <laughs> one of the one of the uh, selling points of it was this: scanned from a thirty three or thirty five. Uh, millimeter print the trailer and i'm like wow but and then it still points out just so you know this is a third or fourth generation vhs copy the trailer is the only thing in hd i'm like oh oh oh, Uh, listen side note and i'm sorry i'm talking to michael condro right now because peter motioned to me like okay you asked that question which he then proceeded to ask himself michael is my wife's cousin's son so i don't know if that's First cousin, second cousin, or first cousin once removed. But Michael, thanks for being there. Hooray, nepotism. <laughs> but, right, so before we go, Paul, we want to say thank you for doing the program today. Thank you so much for having me. And once again, if any of you are able to check it out, which was the uh, Deadpool annual that you did? Was the annual or biannual? The biannual. I think it was 2014 biannual. We also have a great uh, holiday one with uh, Spider-Man and Deadpool, which is a blast. And we uh, did a Guardians of the Galaxy team up with Ant-Man and Drax, which I really love as well. And then the Cosmic Ghost Rider uh, run. And if you want to check his stuff out, you can go to your local comic book shop. You can go to comicsology.com. You can go to marvel.com or even on the Marvel Unlimited app. You can also see Marvel 616 on Disney Plus, the episode number four, Lost and Found. And you can also find uh, the league on Hulu, I believe. Am I correct? Sure. I get. I, I. I would imagine it's somewhere. Yeah. Black Mondays on Showtime. We've been. Uh, we're coming back for our third season. You can find that on Showtime. And uh, yeah, check up on that too. And in addition, of course, how did this get made? Available on all streaming podcast platforms, I believe. Yes. Are you guys on uh, Amazon now? 
and uh, Sirius? I don't know. I don't know. We always say wherever podcasts are heard. So uh, Unspooled and How Did This Get Made are available wherever podcasts are heard. I think if you type in How Did This Get Made, you'll be able to find it uh, and Unspooled the same thing. So it's, a you know, I, I leave it to Google to tell you where to listen to it. Before we go, how can people get a hold of you on social media? Just pretty much Paul Shear wherever you want to get me, whether that is uh, Twitter or whether that is Instagram. You can even check out my Twitch uh, at Paul Shear. Always Paul Shear. Easy. For The Marvelous, I'm Peter Melnick. I'm Paul Shear. And I'm Eddie Wilson. Excelsior.